Good morning. It is February 8th, 2022. And given that we have a quorum of both the Finance Committee and the Town Council present, I'm calling this meeting to order at 9.03. And I'm going to call people by uh, name and then also our resident um, non-voting members as well. So, uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Um, Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. As a finance committee member, Andy Steinberg is absent. Jennifer Taub. Present. And have we seen Alicia? I don't see her now. Okay. And then um, Bob Hegner. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. And Matt Holloway. Present. Good morning. Otherwise known as Paul Bockelman at this point, but you know, that's okay. Don't worry. I think it's flattery. Okay. So um, we are going to proceed. As I mentioned earlier, Andy is unable to join us this morning. Um, we do, I'm going to put the agenda up. Uh, if I seem a little scattered, it's no surprise. Um, and we have basically, um, today we're going to spend the first part of our meeting and a good part of our meeting, if you will, on the Community Preservation Act committee recommendations. And for that reason, Sarah Marshall has graciously agreed to join us. She is the chair of the CPA committee. Um, and then we're going to spend some time on the first and second quarter financial reports, talk about our schedule going forward after, from to the end of June. And um, we will spend a little time on expense uh, projections. We can talk a little bit about the budget coordinating group. I, Sean, do you have updated figures for us? And the budget projections? Um, yeah, those projections will be what we shared at the BCG meeting. So they can kind of, number six and seven can go together. Okay, great. And then just to mention, we, we do have a four towns meeting coming up uh, on Thursday night at six o'clock. Um, so with that, I'm going, we are going to have public comment, uh, but with that, I'm going to take this down. And I'm going to ask Sarah if you would like us to share one of the reports or how would you like to proceed? Thank you, Lynn. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was not expecting to give a presentation. Uh, last year, I did that at a regular council meeting. So I'm sorry if that was expected. Um, but I can quickly run through our recommendations. I expect you've all seen the report, um, be happy to take questions or just tell it, you what we're proposing. Lynn, is it okay if I share the report and maybe we just go through yeah. each project and Sarah can say a little bit about each one? There's a narrative there too, but maybe Sarah can yeah. highlight. Uh, right, I was gonna question. suggest that either you pull it up or I pull it up, but if you can, great, thank you. A little larger is oh, always appreciated. A little larger. Okay, yeah. that's good. Why don't you start there? Oops, can you just back up for, for the Smaller. previous page? Uh, one more, yeah. Yes, I just want to note um, the projected uh, funds available for this current round, which is uh, $2,879,000 or so. Uh, the final number, it doesn't come in for some years after the fact, um, but Sonia budgets conserv makes conservative estimates for the amount of funding that will come in for that fiscal year. Um, and so that is the total. We've been fortunate in 
the last year or so, the state's been able to increase uh, its, its match, the percentage of match that it is giving to the participating town. So um, we've had only good news as, as the year uh, goes along. Uh, we generally get more funding, not, not less. So that's wonderful. So would you go to the second page? Sean. So this table shows um, really what are the, the major categories of CPA, the, for which CPA funds can be used. There are three programmatic categories um, specified in the statute, uh, community housing projects, historical preservation projects, and open space projects. Recreation projects can be um, counted towards uh, the spending on open space projects. And the law requires a minimum or requires that a minimum of 10% of new revenue, <laughs> which, which is not, it's not obvious always what new revenue amounts to, but that 10% of new revenue be either allocated to those three major um, programmatic categories or reserved for such future use. All right. So I, I need to pause a minute and ask uh, Athena, are you still with us? Okay, I need to see if Do you I need to, can. Uh, yeah, can you for, bring, to bring Alicia in? Alicia in. Thank yeah, you. I'll bring her in real quick. Yeah, I'm not a host. So, and do, do you mind if I bring Dave Zomek in too, just in case he has? To not at all. Him. Please okay. do. All right, I'm going to go back and to Sharon. Then, Bill, I just want to make sure that you note that um, Alicia Walker has joined us in terms of attendance. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank Sarah, you. Were, were you done with this chart? Or were you still going through? Uh, well, I just wanted to note. So we're, we um, are not, did not receive really any uh, re significant requests for open space projects this year. As you probably remember, uh, CPA, some sizable <laughs> awards have been made in recent years to open space projects. So they have not, uh, the town has not submitted any more such projects in the last two years. All right, if you proceed. So, um, one category of expenditure of CPA funds that we need that needs to be approved, but we really have no choice about doing it, is to pay for debt service on previously authorized CPA projects for which bonding uh, was required. So, you can see here that four hundred eighty-eight thousand seven hundred twenty dollars will be needed to fund uh, fiscal year 23 debt payments on the projects that are listed in the table below that. Some of those projects will be uh, concluded. I think one of them this year, I thought, maybe not. Yeah, it looks like we're in nine of, year nine of 10 for two of the projects. So it looks like almost. Karis Land, Kiaris? Yeah, Kiaris oh, yeah, five is a five, five. five. Okay, yeah. all right. Yes, most, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we'll just note that, oops, you can continue, that, that the Jones Library Special Collections um, project, since it has not begun and no funds have been borrowed, uh, we have not started any debt payments for that. All right. Okay, so now to the categories of uh, CPA uh, support. First, community housing. We are recommending, just to count them, one, two, three, five, five projects this year. Uh, two of them uh, being requests directly from the town. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. They're all essentially for, for uh, town projects. Um, uh, development, acquisition and development of transitional housing that the, the town has proposed to do. I believe this um, effort is, uh, will be accompanied by some of the ARPA funds, if, if memory holds. So to, to find and rehabilitate or build as needed 
um, transitional housing. Yeah, just to um, add to what Sarah said, there's a million dollars earmarked of ARPA funds um, for issues around homelessness and housing. Right, right. And supportive transitional housing um, uh, provides services to folks who maybe have not been able to house themselves independently and gets them ready to move into, into housing, <coughs> excuse me, independently. Um, connected with that, I think, and the town's larger efforts around developing housing, um, prompted, I believe, by council's uh, new comprehensive housing policy, the town wishes to hire a part-time housing coordinator, um, non-benefited and a temporary position, uh, it, uh, to be paid up to $100,000 over perhaps three years. Um, I think this, the, the town would work out the hours and, and all that, but to help um, planning staff uh, with the many ongoing and hopefully future efforts to develop or improve housing, affordable housing in Amherst. Um, the next two, proposals or recommendations come from the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. Um, they apply regularly for CPA funds. And in fact, CPA is almost the only source of funding for this trust. Um, so this year we are uh, recommending that they be awarded $250,000 of CPA funds, which is, if approved, is transferred directly into their account. That's unlike all other projects, which are reimbursed, but the housing trust can, can hold the funds um, directly and then use them um, when opportunities arrive. So this award would help build their trust account and enable them to respond quickly as, um, projects come forward. Hopefully there'll be some movement on the Belchertown Road and East Street School uh, projects this year. And I know they have, you know, some other ideas uh, perhaps they can move forward on. In connection with that, they've we are recommending an award of $30,000 to support a consultant. Um, they have used a part-time consultant, a woman who is a long uh, professional history of uh, work in community housing and affordable housing, and she um, provides expert assistance as they work their way through all the uh, proposals and RFPs and recommendations. And then the last project we're recommending to you from the community housing category is funds $87,934 to um, help repair uh, the building envelope at the John C. Nutting um, housing project, which is at Chestnut Court. Um, and you may not have observed this building. It's, it's not one of the brick buildings. It's set in the far back in a corner and it's uh, clabbered. I think that in construction right now. Um, so they also have um, matching funds from the state to put towards this project. So we are, would be contributing half of what is needed. Are there any, Lynn, I'd, or I don't know who's, <laughs> who's chairing, but do you want to um, allow yeah, for yeah. questions as we go along? Dorothy, do you have questions on the housing ones? Um, I, I have a, a, a basic question. Um, all of the debt service means that sometimes money is used to do something and then joined with borrowing. Um, the top items here look like they're for uh, staff and for people, which does not involve borrowing. But when you get to the nutting building envelope, is that the total amount of money you're going to put on it? Or is that going to be used as seed money to borrow other money to do that? None of these um, need borrowing. These are all effectively cash, cash okay. reimbursement. Okay. Thank and uh, Dorothy, just to clarify, I believe, Sarah, uh, that you mentioned for the uh, John C. Nutting building envelope that there was a state matching grant. Yes. 
They've okay. already they've already secured that. Yeah. Okay, Kathy. Um, hi, Sarah. Thank you for this. Um, um, I have a. I it's it's not um any concern with the grant, but I just want to understand with the affordable housing trust, the two hundred and fifty, when we voted on the East Street School and when we voted on the Belcherton Road purchasing the property, did we? have a sense that the trust would be coming back for additional funds for those projects? And, you know, and I'm asking it sort of more in a forward looking way that as we first, both of those, we for those who want a background on East Street School, we transferred a property um, to them that the town owned and on Belcher Town Road, we purchased a, a new property. So this would augment those funds as I understand it. And it's just a, I'm trying to get a sense as we look down the road to the total costs of some of these that are drawing from CPA. I think um, it is reasonable to expect that the housing trust will apply every year for CPA funds because this is, as I said, pretty much their only source of funds. So if they want to build, if they want to build something themselves, if they think they need to put it, put some money into a project to leverage uh, um, uh, developers funding or, or other sources of support, they would have that. If they need to um, do studies of a property first, like see if there really is asbestos or whatever in the in the old school building or, you know, wetlands determinations, they're various, they face various costs um, in, as they're pursuing affordable housing projects. So they, they come to us for that. And oh, if they buy property, then of course, properties, <laughs> properties expensive. Right, so I'd like to ask either Paul or David or Sean, uh, whether or not you have anything further to say about the expectations for additional need for CPA money for Belchertown and East Street School. Dave would probably be the best to speak to it because he's working on the, the proposals that have come in uh, in regards to the RFP that was issued. So, And David has his hand up. Please go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Lynn. And, and thanks, Kathy, for the question. Um, I think it's reasonable to to assume that we may hear either from the trust, the town, or from the selected developer for the E Street School Belchertown Road sites, that um, one of those one of those bodies might come back and ask for additional support for the um, for the project. We're we're in the midst of right in the middle of the review process. We put out an RFP for for those two sites and we receive proposals and we're reviewing those now. Um, there is a committee that, that I am chairing uh, reviewing those. We're very excited about the project. We think it's gonna result in a very significant number of affordable units for the town and, and uh, we'll, we'll get that going as soon as we can. But I think it's reasonable to assume that uh, there may be a, an additional ask um, of, of CPA um, or of the trust uh, for their their uh, their existing funds that they have on hand. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, David, while we're on that particular project, so you're in the process of review and you have re re received proposals. Did the proposals, if you can't say anything, just say, I can't answer that. Did, all a, did a significant number, a sufficient number of the proposals respond to doing both projects? Because I know in the past we had a problem with East Street School maybe not being an attractive project. We feel very comfortable that, that we are going to move forward on both sites. Um, okay. So we're, we're excited about it. We, we, we have some very, very, very solid proposals and, and, and um, experienced uh, organizations that have submitted who wanna do work in the town of Amherst. Um, they're excited about, about the, the land that we've amassed both at, at uh, East Street and at, um, and at um, Belchertown Road. Um, and the RFP spoke specifically to retaining the East Street School. So um, as, part of the, as part of the development. So all of those elements uh, make it for a very exciting um, uh, process. So 
Do you have an estimated time frame when you think there might be an award made? I think it's reasonable to think by the end of this month. Okay. Um, All right. Thank you. I'm sorry to digress, but, uh, and I want to go back, Sonia, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I just want for clarity for um, the benefit of the new council members here that when we transfer money to the affordable housing trust, it's still in the town's treasury. So it's just in another account on our books here. So all invoices, all proposals, all contracts and everything go through the town. And when money is transferred from CPA to the trust, they're still held to CPA regulations. So I just wanted to make that clear. We don't, it's all still part of the town. Okay, Bernie. An observation, I think, uh, uh, and I, I want to just express my thanks to, to Sarah and for all the work on the CPA stuff and to Dave for his leadership around the housing piece, because I know there's a huge amount of work involved in this. Uh, my concern is, is that the um, <clears throat> we're the sole means of support right now for the Affordable Housing Trust. And what I would do is uh, encourage um, the CPA committee encourage uh, those town employees who work with uh, housing trust to press them to gain some additional outside funding. It's simply not healthy to have um, for any not-for-profit organization to have one funding stream. Um, and and th that's a concern. And, and I think it would be appropriate since we're also paying for their consultant to have them set a goal of uh, some, uh, some percentage of outside money coming into the organization. The other observation is, is that as we, we go through and we develop more affordable housing and we develop transitional housing, um, we should really begin to press this on, as a, to happen on a regional basis because well, Amherst is making a great effort. Um, I'm not convinced that our, our neighbors are doing so. And um, if we build it, folks will come. Uh, I don't have a problem with providing uh, affordable housing where it's needed. But I do think there's a, some some uh, reason to, to to advocate for regional equity in this, getting our surra surrounding communities to do uh, to make make a considerable comparable effort. Thanks. Um, I just want to add to some information that Bernie has shared. Amherst is around twelve percent, maybe even close to thirteen. We're required to be at ten, or that's the goal. And our surrounding communities, for instance, Pelham, I think, is just building their first affordable housing. I might be incorrect on any of that, and I stand to be corrected, and I'm glad to be. Um, Matt Holloway, please go ahead. Morning. Um, yeah, I'll echo Bernie and just thank you all for this uh, really important work and great work and everything is very clear. As a new person, um, I'm just gonna make a clarifying question slash statement. You can correct me if I'm way off. And then I, I was curious about the um, the tra uh, acquisition and development, the first item, um, the 500 here, and then the additional million in um, recovery funds. Um, so my first question, the uh, Southeast Street Rock Farm is a completely separate project from the Southeast Street School. Is that correct? The East Street School? Those are two different things. Okay, I, I thought so. I just want to make sure. Um, and then in terms of the uh, acquisition development of transitional housing, that, that 1.5, um, I guess I'm just curious if there is a timeline on the expenditure of those funds in that project, either you know, baked within the recovery monies or, um, or here, and, and if so, or, and also if there's any uh, you know, kind of actionable um, plots that we're looking at right now, just sort of what, the, what that looks like down the road. Yeah, so I can start and then Dave, maybe you want to jump in. So with the recovery money, um, we've asked departments to report to us quarterly on sort of the progress with spending these funds. Um, Dave's the lead for this particular one on, on homelessness because of all the issues he works with. Um, so we've talked about timelines where if the funds aren't spent by a certain point, we have to pull those back and potentially repurpose them for other um, other ARPA eligible expenditures. Um, we're not at that point, obviously, yet, but but we do have um, sort of milestones built in to check on progress. Okay, David.
So yeah, again, a, a great question. And yeah, Sean indicated the ARPA funds. Yeah, uh, a couple of years to to um, spend those. I, I don't really have a timeline for for this half a million. I will say that we are, my staff and I are investigating a number of properties right now for potential acquisition. Um, we moved really quickly on the, the we collective we staff and then then committees and boards on the acquisition of the uh, Belchertown Road property that we then combined with the East Street School property and did this this combined RFP, which made it much more um, um, just just much more uh, um, 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 appealing to uh, these these affordable housing um, uh, com uh, development firms. Um, so we're looking at a number of properties, as you can imagine, you know, that the, the market, the real estate market in Amherst is both tight and it's also very competitive. So we're trying to look at, we probably have a list of five to seven properties we're looking at right now and talking with some of the owners about those. Some of them are, are on the market and some of them, frankly, are, are private conversations we're having uh, for properties that may not be on the market. Um, but we we know the owners may be willing to at least have a discussion with us. So so there's no way to really say by you know January of 2022 we will have or 23 we will have this money spent. It's more how do we move conversations forward? And and my approach is kind of moving three or four or five different conversations forward at the same time, and never putting all of your efforts into one because. In real estate, things can just go south very quickly. An owner decides, you know, I don't want to sell right now, or a family says, you know, you need three to three or four family members to make a decision, and two out of three say, no, I just I changed my mind. So what we try to do is move multiple properties forward um, after doing an assessment with my staff of of the characteristics of those properties. Where are they re relative to the downtown, a village center, um, uh, uh, bus routes? Bike routes, sidewalks, other 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 services, et cetera. So, uh, our goal really is to try to look at properties for the most part in village centers or downtown. So, I, I hope that's helpful. D David, do you foresee the council needing to take any action with regard to acquisition of property with regard to either this money or the ARPA money? Eventually, yes. Eventually, yes. If if the town desi decides to purchase property, which I hope we will, and that is the plan. So yes, in the next twelve to twenty-four months, yes. Okay, and that would be for the homeless. Uh, we're looking on two fronts, Lynn. We're looking. Okay. Uh, we're looking at um, because the ARPA money comes in two buckets. One is for affordable housing. Affordable housing. Um, broadly defined, and the other is for homelessness. So uh, Paul has, has, has charged me with looking into sites for both affordable housing and uh, the potential for a permanent uh, site for a shelter. Thank you. Sarah, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to to two comments. Um, so going backwards, um, what Dave said, just said, um, I would just remind council that I guess it was a year, a year ago, maybe two, two years ago, I lose track. Um, the Belchertown Road property, that the acquisition was an out of cycle CPA um, uh, application to borrow funds for that purpose. So that had to go to council, I mean, for two reasons. You know, because it wasn't in it wasn't in that fiscal year's package that we're look like we're looking at now, and plus it was borrowing. So maybe the town has no thought right now of needing to do that, but I would say that's always a possibility. And then to Matt's question, I think no, or Bernie about um, uh, whether the trust could find other funding streams. Certainly a very good idea. Um, I. I think I remember that the first council authorized an Airbnb tax and that the money could be directed to the housing trust. I don't know if that ever happened. Maybe I misremember, but it, um, it would be good because CPA does have restrictions and the trust has been unable to do some things with that Belchertown Road property because CPA doesn't permit it. 
my recollection is that we were we did 30 percent but i'm looking to sean paul and david um i don't believe it's we we do have the tax the short-term rental tax i don't believe it's going into the housing trust but i can check with sonia on that or sonia maybe you, you know the answer to that um, depends on whether we're talking about the impact fee or the tax because the tax is not broken out of hotel motel so I, the DOR doesn't break that down. So we don't have that figure. It was the impact fee. And I think that we had the option of going to 3% or something like that. Right. I'm, I'm not sure if we went to 3%, but um, we have not spent any of that, of those and, impact fees yet. And, and they, and I, they, they go to free cash, they follow the free cash. So it would have to be an appropriation out of free cash equivalent. So I guess as a follow-up on that, it would be useful for the finance committee and the council to understand what that revenue has looked like and what we did, what action we did take. It was a while ago. Yeah, it would be great if it could go to the trust. <laughs> yeah, Lynn, I'll add one, two more quick things. Um, it's very, it's not a very large amount. Um, yeah. My recollection is it's like around $10,000, somewhere in that range that we currently get. Um, right. And then the other thing I'll just mention there is legislation currently um, being talked about around a real estate transfer um, charge that if passed would um, potentially produce funding for affordable housing that could go to the trust. Um, it's a, it would be a surcharge or a charge on every transfer of real estate or, or certain eligible transfers of real estate. So I know the um, John Hornick and the trust are, are looking at that legislation and um, I think they're supportive of it. Uh, I'm going to call on Bernie, but I also, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, just quickly, oh. um, just to, to um, our approach has always been that the funds come into the town, goes into the general fund, and then the town council appropriates. We don't dedicate streams of revenue to specific projects. Um, That's just not the policy that we approach with our streams of revenue. Okay, thank you. Um, Bernie. Yeah, um, again, when when I said uh, multiple funding streams, I should clarify, I mean, something other than the town of Amherst, um, you, you know, taxation from the town of Amherst, uh, having some non-public money to use as a lever for certain projects, as Sarah referred to, um, can be very helpful. And I, I really do think, and I am not, this shouldn't be heard as a criticism, because there's a huge amount of work that's gone into this. People have done a wonderful job but we need to diversify the funding stream for the, the, the housing trust. So that means uh, grants from charitable organizations, other sources of funding other than taxation. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions about housing, the five housing projects? Sarah, you did a phenomenal job of pulling that one together. Let's move <laughs> on to historic preservation. All right. So we have we are recommending one, two, three, four, five projects in this category. Um, all of them pertaining by definition to historic structures. Um, the first is to uh, allocate up to $240,000 to repairs, preservation uh, efforts at um, on the exterior of the Conkey Stevens house which is on Main Street down near the, the dental office. It is a privately owned um, building. It's office condos. Uh, and I'm talking about the, the historic building. I believe there's some newer construction in the back um, that may be uh, more residential, but, but the brick house with some ornate trim at the front. Um, uh, it is in, in significant need of exterior repairs. They've already done quite a bit of work and have uh, assessed, you know, made extra assessments on the owners to complete a lot of work, but they are asking for funds from CPA. Um, and I will say, that, and maybe we'll be getting into this more, um, the legislation, the program does permit these funds public funds, the CPA funds, to go towards preservation of privately owned properties. Um, but the exterior, work on the exterior, exterior to preserve the historic view that is considered the public benefit in, in that 
situation. Um, the second project we're recommending is an $18,800 allocation to the Amherst Historical Society to do an engineering study of the Simeon Strong House. That's the building right next to the library, the museum. The house itself is part of the museum. Um, it has never had uh, a structural assessment. It's, um, it's old and it probably is in need of some work and they would uh, very much like to do this before construction begins immediately next door. Um, the third project is $135,000 to the Amherst Women's Club for repairs and painting the exterior of the Alice Maud Hills House, a beautiful building at the corner of Triangle and Main Street. Um, as you may know, the club has um, raised and spent significant funds on interior improvements and repairs, and, and I think some exterior repairs over the last five years or so. It's absolutely gorgeous inside, um, and they would like some help in repairing and improving the exterior. The fourth project uh, is another $50,000 to the West Cemetery. Um, CPA grants of that amount. I think this would be the at least the third, maybe the fourth grant to the West Cemetery. The first several grants are devoted to repairing and preserving the headstones, the markers there, which are um, they've been damaged by time, by weather, by vandalism. But they also want to complete the fencing. Um, right now, there's just a, a chicken wire fence along the east side and it is collapsing. Um, so they want to make an historically appropriate fence that will match the existing fence. And they also want to make some signs, some interpretive signs. Um, the final project in this category comes from a group of residents um, uh, in District 1. They have the support of the conservation department for this project, and that is to do some research, um, both uh, archival and I think in, on the ground, on the landscape along the Mill River on conservation land, where there used to be many different mills powering small manufacturing operations. They want to uncover that history and um, use the information they collect to, in a future phase, develop an interpretive trail through that area. That trail does not involve creating any new footpath. It's purely the existing walking trail, but perhaps it, the, the hope is, but not as part of phase one, eventually to have signs along the way that tell people what used to be there and what still exists. Right. Any so we're going to pause here and I'm going to call on Dorothy Pam. Okay, so I, I have two questions um, on the slate roof. Um, do you have somebody who does that? Or I used to live in a development with slate roofs and at, this was many years ago. We had very old men who still knew how to do it. Um, and I, I love slate roofs. So that's number one. Do, do we actually have somebody that knows how to do it? And uh, the other one is the question on the Amherst Women's Club. Uh, I just wanted to add that, um, yes, the Amherst Women's Club has raised great money and has done a wonderful job um, renovating the inside, but it, during COVID has lost tremendous income because uh, from uh, weddings and memorial services. Um, so, you know, just absolutely struggling to, to survive. And I, I guess I was wondering why there was one negative vote. Everything else was positive all the way. And there was one negative vote in the Amherst Women's Club. So I was a little concerned about that. So, okay, yeah. Um, so first about the, the slate roof, um, the Conky Stevens House owners, uh, they, got, they got bids and submitted bids from all kinds of contractors on all the different areas mm -hmm. of work. There are a lot of slate <laughs> roofs Good. in town Good. and in the area. And there are certainly, I can't remember who who they talk to, but mm -hmm. this is a thing they can get done properly, I'm sure. Right. 
Um, oh, the one negative uh, nay vote. Um, one person felt that too much of, of the painting was, should be considered maintenance and not be eligible for CPA funding. Um, but that is the reason why we say funds cannot be used to paint the carriage house because there are no repairs being proposed there. That, that would be purely cosmetic. Mm -hmm. But um, the main house, and sort of all the parts to that, the main house mm -hmm. uh, do need exterior work and there's repairs. Mm -hmm. And so then there's painting required. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kathy. I'm just unmuting. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, if you can just scroll back to the Conque Stevens house. Um, um, Sarah was uh, very careful to point out, and I called her on this, that um, this is a privately owned uh, house. And I looked up the property value. It's It's got about 16 different 15 different units in it. Many of them are kind of an office condo and one rental. The assessed value is just shy of a million dollars. And my concern is even though it's eligible, um, I'm questioning the use of CPA funds where there is really no public benefit here other than being able to look at it when we drive down the street. Um, there's no public access to it, which is quite different than the women's club that's used often um, when, when pre-COVID days that people can go in, they can take tours there. You can't knock on the door here and say, let me take a tour. So I, I'm worried that we start setting a precedent um, because if I look around Amherst, we've got a lot of gorgeous historic homes. Um, so, and including some on the Na National Historic Register. So um, this one doesn't feel like a good fit to me on compared to the other historic, even if it is eligible. So I don't know whether we can think in terms of creating a policy that Amherst does or just thinking of being much tougher on this because it feels to me it opens up a gateway to other requests similar to this. Well, I'm gonna go on and um, call on Bernie and then I also have a comment on the same one that Kathy just mentioned. Bernie? I think we're all thinking along the same lines. I was wondering what preservation restrictions are being placed on the funds to the Conkey Stephen House and the Amherst Women's Club. Um, it, you know, these are, pub, these are privately owned buildings. Um, historical preservation, by the way, doesn't mean you can go inside. It just means you can look at it from the outside. The, yeah. the, yeah. Most of the rules around historical preservation don't care what you do inside its appearances. Um, exterior appearances, but but um, yeah, I mean the the legislation allows us to to do preservation restrictions. Um, you know, it might be appropriate on the Conkey Stevens house to say, if the uh, if the building sold, um, the, the town gets the money back, or it gets a portion of the money back. Um, the same thing with the uh, with the women's club. I mean, there's there's different ways to look at this, and I'm, I was wondering if. Uh, uh, town council or town, town attorney has been involved in uh, discussing any kind of preservation restrictions. Um, Michelle, do you have a question on this particular area? No, please go oh. ahead. And I'll okay, so I'm, I want to push on exactly the same thing. And, and Kathy, I'm just going to say, unfortunately, the precedent has been set a long time ago. Um, it involved a, ha a house on Northeast Street. $200,000 was spent on it. And I have to say, I gulped. I'm like going, excuse me, is this how I want my tax money spent? So Bernie, you raise an interesting question of whether or not at some point, does this mean the town has an interest, if you will, in these, in these properties that should they be sold, we should get some benefit from that. And I guess we just have to turn back to Paul, David, Sonia, and Sean and ask if they have any comment or whatever. Dave, again, might be the best person to talk about the restrictions, but um, we, can, we can certainly come back with that information. David, do you want to speak to it now? Sure. 
I can add a few comments, Lynn. I, I'm not, I'm probably not the best person to, to speak to these, but, um, you know, my understanding is that each of these, and, and, and we've had similar discussions at the CPA meetings, you know, over in many years past, um, as Bernie said, and others said, you know, this is, this is a very standard pr um, practice and, you know, that many municipalities across the, the Commonwealth do invest in these uh, private, private structures that um, are important to the historic character and the historic um, and the history of, of the town of Amherst. And I believe, and, and Sonia could help me out here, but I believe that uh, these were recommended by the Historical Commission for support um, at this level. We have history. Uh, my staff does work with each of the, uh, each of the uh, applicants on historic preservation restrictions. And in, in both these cases, um, there would be a requirement for a historic, a permanent historic preservation restriction to be placed on the exterior of the of both structures. So, um, I guess that's probably all I can say. But um, Sarah, do you have more you want to add to that one? Um, yes, I want to say that the historic commission strongly um, ob objected to, or at least some members don't have a you know statement from 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 the chair. Um, strongly objected to um, uh, limiting or, or or refusing to fund uh, the preservation work solely because of the ownership status. Um, and they sent me uh, they sent me some screenshots of websites, a state website that directs fund private homeowners to the CPA project. Uh, to, program if they if they own an historic building and it's in need of repair. I mean, it's um, this, I do not believe this was an oversight of the legislation. Private um, owners of historic properties do not qualify for other kinds of grants. And the, one of the purposes of the CA, CPA program, it's my understanding, is to make them eligible. They have to compete you know, if the floodgates are open and the CPA committee receives, you know, seven proposals from private homeowners, you know, not everything's going to get funded. Um, but if if what I mean, I think the alter there are two alternatives. One is that those properties, historic properties, which we value um, for their contribution to the hist historic character of the town, get more and more dilapidated. Or you're asking or saying that they have to be owned by nonprofits and go off the tax rolls in order to get CPA funding. And I'm not sure either of those alternatives is um, good. So they they are they are eligible. The fact that maybe people don't know that, you know, the, the, if they're now taking advantage of something that's available to them, I don't think we can. Um, you might think it's just not a project worth doing, but I don't think the home ownership, the status of who owns it should be a factor. Um, I'm, I want to stick to this issue. Michelle, you said this was not uh, one of your questions. Is that correct? That is correct. Dorothy, is, do you, is your question related to this? Um, it's just a, a quick fact that the Amherst Women's Club is a 501c3. It's a nonprofit, and it gives raises money to yearly to give donations to Amherst social service agencies and scholarships for local high school students. So I just wanted to put that in there. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, is your question or comment related to this? Yep. So um, with I wanted Sarah covered a lot of what I was going to say in my comment, um, which thank you for context. I was on CPA this past year and so was able to discuss this project um, and the historic um, historical commission. Also, this was their number one ranked project when they went through them. Uh, they did recommend this one as the as their top ranked um, the, the Conkey Stevens house is their top ranked one. They said, you know, supportive and high priority for the town. 
and that it's really important to carry out those first phases that are described in the funding. So, you know, I, I do think we had a lot of really robust discussion. We had similar concerns that that you are that some of you are having now about the accessibility of the building. But um, as Sarah said, we determined that it's eligible and that the historic status, I mean, the the view of it from the street does matter in terms of the historic preservation of this building. So that was ultimately where we came to. And I know that that's can be a little bit of a hard pill to swallow because there are really deeply meaningful projects and this might be less deeply meaningful. But when we look at the requirements for CPA, deeply meaningful isn't necessarily on there. Historic preservation is. So, you know, I mean, I think that that's, it's worth noting the historical commission did very strongly recommend this project. Thank you for sharing that, Anna. Pat, related to this? Yeah, just very quick. What is actually, um, what is going on in the Conkley Stevens house? It, 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 it sounded like it was businesses. Or I'm, I'm unclear. If that could get clarified for me. What? Office condos is what I've been told. They're small. So, okay, so they're office condos and they're not gonna be responsible for painting. And, and, and repair of their building. It, it, I, I'm, they, I'm, they have already made a lot of repairs recently. So I think my interpretation is they feel they cannot, um, that, that, that they're, they can't get more money in special assessments, you know, from the owners at this point. And some of their uh, work is urgently needed. They've already done a lot of urgently needed work, but there's more. So when you say condos, you literally mean it is condos. It's got multiple owners. It's an association uh, that owns various. It's an association and individual businesses own parts of that. I have not checked the property card. Yep. That is my understanding. Maybe no. Kathy has. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I checked the property cards because I was curious, Pat, for the same thing. There, as I said, there were, you know, I, I did it pretty quickly, but there were about 16, 15, 16, and each is owned by a specific person. So when you go into those addresses, you get this unit and the various, and one is um, an apartment rental, and it's the biggest, and, to, and the, the property card shows the assessed value of each of them. So my, I wondered why they can't get um, a bank loan long-term take on debt for these kinds of repairs, because it, it's, at least as assess value, it's a valuable property. You know, they have collateral as a property. Um, so that's why I raised this question. I, I happen to live in an 1820 farmhouse, but it would, I'm hoping that we would never approach CPA for repair of our slate roof. Um, you know, that, and if we did, someone would say, why don't you do it? Um, you know, uh, you know, you know, in terms of it's, it's the house has value. So it, it is each one of these units. And there was a pretty big variety of what, what the condo was. It listed the little businesses that are in them in the offices. Thanks. Uh, Bernie. Uh, again, I, I, I'm not objecting to the projects per se. The question was what, um, what preservation res restrictions have been placed on it to ensure that the town's investment, if you will, uh, is sustained. So, um, you know, what keeps the, uh, uh, the Conkey Stevens house to be sold and then at some point raised and, you know, something else going up in its place. Um, the other alternative where you do have a commercial operation like um, condos, and um, Great Barrington has done this. You can uh, have the opportunity to negotiate in that if the building sold or transferred, uh, that all or some of the money that the town's invested in it comes back to the town for another project. So okay. um, that that's my my question is is you know how is the town the town's acquired an interest in these buildings because the town has given it money given them money. So my question is how is our interest being protected? Thank you. David, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, if I understand you correctly, Bernie. So, so 
the historic preservation restriction, the sequence is really important because of course, um, similar to an APR on a farm, a farmer or the owners of, of the Conkey Stevens House or, or the, the 501c3 nonprofit of the Amherst Women's Club would not put a restriction on it until a couple of things have happened. Number one, that the council votes for the funding and that the project is moving forward. So um, we don't have a, a, a historic preservation restriction on the Conkey Stevens House at this time or the Amherst Women's Club we would only have that in the sequence of essentially, it's almost like a closing that you, if the funding is voted for and the project moves forward, all the contracts are signed. We have a couple of things. We have a grant agreement with every, every uh, successful applicant for CPA dollars. And then lawyers get together on, on both the town side and the, the applicant side and work out a historic preservation restriction which then gets filed with the no Registry color. of Deeds so as a permanent restriction. So that's kind of the sequence. So our interests are protected by that historic preservation restriction. And as I think you alluded to earlier, Bernie, that restriction is typically on the external features of the building, those features that can be enjoyed by the public from the public way or visiting the building for business or you know, an event, for instance, at the Amherst Women's Club, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so the restriction doesn't go on until there is a project and there is funding, and and that is the way the town uh, secures its interest for in exchange for the um, for the CPA dollars. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think what Bernie is wondering is whether there is a way to also be clear that if the property is sold, we would get some of the profit from the sale back as because we invested in the property. I'm and not aware that that ever happens with the historic preservation restriction. The, the restriction is a permanent restriction that runs with the deed. So this is meant to be in perpetuity, just like an APR or a conservation restriction. So it would make raising the building extremely difficult, but the, I'm not aware, I've never been part of a conversation regarding a historic preservation restriction where there's been a clause in there about sale of the, of the property and then some sort of repayment of, of CPA funds. I, I'm just not familiar with that ever being part of a restriction. It's not to say, you know, it, it couldn't happen, but I, I, I'm not familiar with that at all. I, I guess what people are asking is that maybe we would investigate that, um, to, given the robust nature of this conversation. Bob, is your question related to this? Yes, I just wanted to ask David. <clears throat> so we put a, a historic preservation restriction on the deed. What happens 30, 40 years from now if the owner at that time comes back to the town and says we need more money to do extra ex repairs are we uh, does that prevent the owners from doing that or are we potentially liable to keep every so many years keep you know uh restoring or or um you know kind of repainting or whatever uh the, these structures I think that's a great question. I, I don't think there's anything that that prohibits an owner from coming back if there are other issues that might be, you know, uh, central to the, for instance, the structural integrity of a historic building. I mean, buildings, you know, perpetuity is a very long time. So if some, if you know, if if the women's club or the Conkey Stevens House. Uh, needs work in 50 years and the CPA is still ongoing, I don't, I don't think there's anything that precludes them from coming back. Um, it's not like one, one, one time and you're done, one and done. Um, so I've not, I, I'm not familiar with any situation where, where that has happened, I think in, in my time with the town, but, but perpetuity is a long time. So um, um it's possible, I suppose, that a group could come back. 
But Dave, um, it doesn't obligate us to make no. any future either. You no, still have to no... go through process. Yeah. Right. There's that, no was, that was my point. It, it, okay. There's, yeah. Okay. Dorothy, do you have fact, another uh, comment? Me... Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. No, I was just going to say if, if, if a proponent came back kind of within memory, I think the committee would look askance. <laughs> okay. Dorothy, another comment on this? Yes. Uh, I want to say that I think the whole purpose for this historical project is that money and value are not the same thing. Um, it's not that, oh, I live in a beautiful old house and I'm going to spend the money needed to fix it up and I'll get that back. You usually do not get the money back. That's why we need the CPA funds. Um, you do it because it's important that that building stay and excel the exterior that tells us the history of the town. So uh, the idea that that you can fix the outside or paint it or fix it, whatever, and that money will come back when you sell it. That's not how it goes. And I've, I've lived in old houses. So the market doesn't fix everything. And I, I believe that this money is here in order to do things that need to be done, which in fact, don't really pay for themselves. So thank you. All right, Michelle, you've been enormously patient. Please go ahead. And now I do have a question on this actually, <laughs> in addition to a more general uh, or a, a different question. Um, so is this property owner or owners currently bound by any design covenants, given that it's on the National Historic Register that would make it more costly for them to do the types of exterior repairs they need to do? I believe that because the building is in a historic district and on the register they would have to get uh, the historical commission's approval for any exterior changes so yeah they're constrained that's that's yeah kind of the the it's great to live and own a historical structure but then that also puts you uh puts obligations or limits on what you can do yeah, yeah. In my experience, it can be really costly to meet those um, those design covenants that are often in place here. So um, yes, I would say slate slate is expensive. It's much cheaper to put on a you know asphalt shingle roof. So slate's beautiful and very heavy, and it does degrade over time. So right. Michelle, you had your hand up before all of this. So <laughs> I do proceed. <laughs> Yeah, so seeing the community award on here, it prompts me to ask the question about reimbursement. And um, I think, Sarah, that I heard you say that these projects are reimbursed. So I'm wondering if there are any options for an applicant, particularly a community applicant that may not have funding to um, pay for a project up front. Um, how would they be able to sort of apply for and, and receive an award and be able to, to go through that process if they weren't able to make that upfront payment? This is where I call a friend and ask for Sean or Sonia to, to say what, what can be done if a group has cash flow problems that is that is um, come up with some nonprofits as well. So Sonia, do you want to speak know. to when we've, um, I think we've worked with contractors directly in the past? Yeah, um, we've never really had this issue come up before. Uh, what we have done, though, is once the uh, vent the vendor or the grantee gets an invoice from their contractor, they can they can submit that right away, and we pay them, and they didn't have the money to to move it over to the um, contractor. In some cases, we've and I thought it was. Um, I went back and looked and I realized that we, we never we never did pay a contractor directly. I thought we did, but we did not. So all we can do that I'm aware of, and I can do some more research on this, is be timely on cutting that check to the organization so that they can turn it over to the vendor at this point. Okay, okay. So the, 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 the funds can be reimbursed pretty quickly so that it gets paid within 30 or 60 or 90 days. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, work with the contractors to, or they should work with the contractors to get invoicing really timely, and then get it to the second floor to be approved. And it comes down here, we can, we can put a rush on that if we need to. Excellent. Okay, That's thank the best you. Best way to deal with it, in my mind. 
and in addition, the co the contractor would be aware that there was a grant right. available that would give them some assurance that they would get paid. Yeah. Um, Jennifer. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just, you know, as another example of, um, you know, how uh, buildings may come to receive CPA funding grants. I, I recall with the Jewish Community Center a few years ago, yes. the fire um, mm -hmm. was structurally unsound. It was a safety issue and it was $250,000 for some reason to repair it. And so the, the board of the, the JCA didn't have the funds, but the historical commission, and I think rightfully so, said that building belongs really to Amherst. That's an Amherst treasure. So we do not want you to take the spire down because you can't afford to repair it. So they encouraged the JCA to go to apply for a CPA grant, which they did receive. You know, So that's a case where a building, um, where the town may say the building is valuable to us and we want you to do what needs to be done to preserve it. That you are correct, although I think we only gave them fifty thousand. Right. The yeah, it was a lot. They, I think they raised the rest of the money. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, going on to open space, no categories. Rick, uh, can I just ask a question? When there's no categories, uh, no none in that category, uh, do we have to put certain amount of money aside for future in that category? We might, except in this case, recreation awards are are considered part of that open space, meeting that open space obligation. Okay, thank okay. you. Yep, please proceed. All right, so we have another five proposals in the recreation category. The first of which is to uh, give, give a relatively small uh, award to the Amherst Elementary Schools to start designing improvements or replacement to one of their aging playgrounds. Not, not the playground that was built or with CPA funds just like in the last 10 years, but a different um, mm -hmm. playground. All right. And then we expect, because their, their, their application was actually for $500,000, um, we, we were not ready to go that far this year, but we would expect that after they um, expend this grant, they, will, they may well come back uh, and request further CPA funds to undertake whatever they feel is necessary. The next award is $38,000 to the town to improve uh, the irrigation at the Plumbrook Fields. These, this Plumbrook Fields area is very heavily used uh, recreation area. It's also either or both wet in some areas and very dry in other areas. So there has been uh, years ago, a well um, installed and the underground pipes and sprinkler heads that are supposed to pop up and irrigate the field, that it, the well no longer produces water, no longer collects water. They fill in over time. I think the town has done, DPW has done what it could to try to extend the life of that well. So, so there's that problem. And also <laughs> these, as many homeowners, I think, uh, end up discovering these subsurface pipes and the sprinkler heads um, are problematic and they're creating problems in the field, divots um, or the, the heads are a hazard, a hazard to the athletes. So they want to abandon that system, develop a new well, and then use water cannons that can be can be moved to irrigate only those places which need to be irrigated. <laughs> um, they would remove the sprinkler heads again because they're uh, a tripping hazard um, and just leave the lines in place. Uh, and as the report here states, it, once this work is done, it'll be a lot less maintenance for DPL, DPW to try to keep the fields in good shape. And the recreation department is very keen <laughs> on, on uh, this improvement. The next project, uh, we recommend $150,000 be given to improving or uh, developing um, a small, uh, a relatively small 
trail, part of the ultimate trail system at Hickory Ridge, uh, and to install some amenities like his kiosks or benches. Um, of course, contingent on the purchase being finalized. I don't know if that's happened yet, but, <laughs> but any day now. Um, the fourth proposal is to uh, a apply $50,000 of CPA funding to repairing uh, heavily used trails throughout the town. We have quite a popular and extensive uh, trail network and um, it's been especially heavily used during the pandemic. And they're just bridges and um, bridges and also what do you call the bog, bog bridges, board kind of a boardwalk thing. Um, that need repair in many places. It's hard to it's hard to keep up. So fifty thousand dollars will just enable the town to do more, not everything, but more. Help them address the backlog. And finally, another community project, or rather brought brought forward by community members. Uh, this one has the the um, very enthusiastic support of the recreation department is to develop some pickleball courts. There is quite a pickleball community in town. Um, they either have to go to other towns that have pickleball courts or uh, compete for use of tennis courts, um, which obviously then displace tennis, tennis players. So their proposal was to uh, build some pickleball courts on the, if you go down the driveway, the Mill River parking, Re recreation area, there's a parking lot, very little used immediately to the left. That's where they envision putting pickleball courts. Um, we recommend this award, but with the understanding that the town will have to determine what is the appropriate site for courts, and it might not be at Mill River, maybe War Memorial, maybe somewhere else. So. We haven't changed the title, but it's possible pickleball courts would, in fact, be constructed somewhere other than Mill River. Pat. Yeah, I, I'm interested in why uh, the pickleball players aren't raising money to support this. When people wanted a dog park, they did an incredible amount of work to fundraise for the proposal. Uh, I have this. I haven't played pickleball yet, so maybe it would change my mind, but I don't understand why we want to spend $120,000 to make a pickleball court uh, when there are so many other things we could use that $120,000 for that would benefit a lot more people. So I'm, I'm curious about why they're not funding it themselves. Why, why isn't that the first step that this group of people uh, looks out for fundraising before they ask the town for money. Can I answer, Lynn? Please. Yeah, I, I don't know if they have considered that. Um, I can imagine uh, two, I mean, I would think one or both of these two things. One, pickleball is a popular sport at all ages. And why shouldn't the town add this to its to its recreation assets, you know? Why build tennis courts? Why don't tennis players raise money for tennis courts? So there's that. Also, I, maybe once there are courts and it builds a, a, an actual Amherst community for that, maybe then they can leverage that into fundraising. But we didn't, I don't believe we addressed that with them. Uh, David, did you have a comment? No, I guess I would just build on what Sarah said. And and um, Pat, I, I think it's it's a good question. And, and I'm not sure we really did explore that with them. They're, as, as Sarah said, they're a very passionate group. They're organized. Right. I give them great credit for doing the work they did to, to pull this all together. Uh, as you know, they I think we might have received more letters and emails on this pickleball proposal than, than I can recall in, in my time with the town on any CPA proposal. So I give them great credit for organizing. And, and to, to Sarah's comment, um, 
pickleball is 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 sweeping the nation really as is a, an extremely popular sport uh, for all ages and and i think to some degree it's it's um you know incumbent upon us to kind of look at it we we have tennis courts we have basketball courts um you know we have pools we have baseball fields we have you know all sorts of recreational facilities and and to create you know two or three courts for this uh this this new sport seems seems reasonable to me um you know i've talked to to the dpw and to the planning staff and and we all kind of came around to it to say, yeah, we should find a place for pickleball courts in Amherst, and and perhaps uh, we could take a message back to the group from this discussion that it would be wonderful if if there were some um, maybe some funds raised to help support the pickleball courts because they will need maintenance over time. Uh, before I call on anybody, I just need to disclose that my husband was one of the signatories to support this proposal. So I, uh, it does not require me to recuse myself. It just requires me to declare that. Bob? You need to unmute, Bob. Sorry, um, I didn't want to talk about pickleball. In fact, I had to look it up. I never heard of it before. <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to talk about Hickory Ridge. So if other people have pickleball issues, uh, let them go forward. Okay, Kathy. Is it a pickleball issue? I'll, I'll just speak quickly to this. First of all, my understanding when I'm the liaison, this isn't one court, they can get as many as three courts into this space. And the amazing thing about pickleball when it's not just cross age, it's cross age and bad knees. Um, bad backs. It keeps seniors outside and little kids can pick it up. So I think the notion that there should be an association raising money, we can get our kids out and playing on this. I think we should really bring the elementary school over there because the whole complex at Mill River allows for you to be swimming, being out on the ball fields, being on the tennis courts. And it's something that um, many towns have only for wealthy people. I mean, that's what, you know, where the pickleballers are inside someplace where you have to pay a fee. So I think that's the reason it's so popular is it's so easy to learn and it's so easy to play for people who can barely move. Um, you know, so it, it goes to the little kids, but also stand there. So I was just going to say that I, I didn't know the group existed, but that Mill River Recreation Area, if anyone hasn't been there recently, it's incredibly used by a broad group of families um, with people take picnic lunches there. They stay all day. So I think the more we can get everybody outside with making complexes like this that are public, it's, it's a, a real public benefit. Dorothy? Well, that was very interesting. I need just a few more things. I don't know what pickleball is. If somebody could explain even what kind of a ball and what you do with it, it would be really helpful. I will explain unless there are any actual players. I've yeah, never I, played it. Okay. I, I, I just learned it a couple of years ago. I'm a tennis player. It's a, a racket that looks more like a ping pong racket. It's short. The ball doesn't bounce very much. The court is much smaller, which is why they can divide a tennis court into two pickleball courts. Um, and, and it has the most weird rules you ever heard on uh, scoring. So I think it teaches people math skills in a bizarre way because it is totally non-intuitive, totally. <laughs> so, but, 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 but I think why it's attractive is that the ball doesn't have to go very far. You know, um, and it's a double two people play against two people normally. So it gets four people out in this pretty small court. Kind of like standing on a ping pong table. But a replacement for tennis. Pam Rooney. Hi, I've got a couple of different topics, but but I could focus on this one. I was thinking about uh, the comment about the dog park. And I suspect that at some point there may be sort of an ongoing maintenance um, fund structure that that the supporters of pickleball can can chip into. Um, certainly with the dog park, the town has contributed a fair amount 
um, in addition to whatever the, the, the dog park um, devotees um, have contributed. So I think in the long run, uh, everyone will be well served by, by us supporting it. Um, a question that I had about the, the playgrounds, um, are there other available funds for, um, for the elementary school playground uh, upgrades? And that's, that's sort of a general question. Where um, do we have to rely on CPA funds for, for uh, elementary school playgrounds? Thanks. Sarah. I believe they can ask JCPC to prioritize their work. And there, to recommend and there is a request. Yeah. Um, just building on what Sarah said, there is a request to JCPC as well. Um, they have a couple playgrounds that are in disrepair. Um, and so there's also a request to uh, JCP or to the really to the town manager um, for capital funds. Okay, um, Kathy, you still have your hand up, but Bob, are we ready to move on to a next issue, please, Bob? Yeah, I just had a question about the Hickory Ridge Trail improvements. I think it's a good idea, but I'm question, my question is, what is the total cost for the entire trail? As I recall discussion we had a long time ago about the purchase of Hickory Ridge, we talked about there was a discussion about we might need to build one or two bridges in there in order to have a trail that goes across the property. So can, can we just get a sense of what the total cost would be for what trail is envisioned? Uh, we're going to call on David, who is our Hickory Ridge expert. Um, yeah, let me let me start by saying we are we're kind of on the one yard line on Hickory. I know it's been a long road, but sometimes in real estate acquisitions, patience is a virtue. So um, Paul Bachman often looks at me and says, you know, comes into my office and says, so how are we doing on Hickory? And we are very close. In fact, I just got a, an email from our attorney. So we're, we're really on the one yard line here. Um, most documents have been signed, closing documents, and we are extremely close. So I expect there to be a, an announcement here in the in the coming days, uh, in the not too near future, that we we do own Hickory. Um, in terms of of total um, cost of trails, it's a little it's a little hard for me to estimate that because. Uh, to some degree, we we haven't permitted, we haven't approached the permitting body. So there may be there may be some trails that we propose that, frankly, the conservation commission um, will say or the state will say, "Sorry, Amherst, you can't do that." So we have a a draft um, a draft plan of all the trails, and you may recall all, all everyone on the call here that. Um, one of the underpinnings of this project has been access to make the land accessible to those people who live around it and visitors, of course, but also to create a north-south access way for people who live uh, on East Hadley Road so that we, we connect them with the village center that, of course, we're investing in uh, with the Mass Works grant and other, other uh, road and sidewalk and other uh, safety improvements. So that is the core trail that we want to try to improve. Um, and by improve, I mean there will be a, it'll be a mosaic of both bituminous asphalt trails as well as crushed stone trails with seating, with kiosks, the other component of this um, in, in terms of where the trails will go are discussions and negotiations with the property owners who, who abut the property. We need to, we are, we already have sought and had preliminary conversations with most of those owners. Um, we have sought um, either easements or understandings with them that we can connect to Mill Valley apartments, the Brook apartments, and some of the private other private holdings in the village center. So all of that work is kind of ongoing and that will determine ultimately how many trails we have and how much they cost. We are building on, I want everybody to understand, we're building on the cart paths that were there from the golf course. We are not, um, we are not, you know, in some cases we will create new, but, but the foundation of the trails is already there. Um, we may need to improve them because, you know, even even during the golf operation, they were kind of let go. So we're going to build um, a 
a, um, a spine, if you will. The trail will be north, south, and off of that trail will be some other interesting trails that take people west to a certain property. In terms of the bridges, the bridges right now are in pretty good shape. Um, and in fact, one of the negotiation pieces that we have is that the central spine trail will go over a bridge that we will actually not need to maintain. That will be maintained the responsibility of the solar uh, developer for the 26 acres of solar. So I, I hope that gives you kind of a, a broad picture of, of how we're going. But, uh, but again, this 150,000 should get us a long way. We also have um, some CDBG funding that we're going to apply to trails as well. Um, are there any other questions regarding this? I, I just want to be conscious of our time and I want to at least get to the financials. Uh, administration and general reserve, any questions on those? Sarah, is there anything else you need to talk about? Uh, no. Well, I just want to point out that the, high, the regional high school did put in an application for uh, fund $800,000 of funding to repair the high school track. Um, we pushed back uh, because it did not comply with the, the recreation plan that had been developed. We don't know if they're going to return to us with a modified proposal or not. So we just don't know. They haven't, they haven't told us that they're not, but unless Sean has an update. Um, I imagine they will. Okay. Um, would, would be my this, guess <laughs> for this year. For this year, next year, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, this year. Yeah. All right. So maybe we're not. <clears throat> excuse me. Not quite done. Um, I just want to say, if I'm if I'm not going to appear before you at another when you when you before you take a vote or however the process goes, I just want to thank um, publicly thank all the members of the committee. Um, and can I name them? They're listed in the report, but I would like to say, give uh, my thanks to Sam McLeod, Anna Devlin Gothier, Sarah Isinger, Hetty Startup, Andrew McDougall, Tim Neal, David Williams, and Katie Allen Sobel. And I thank you very much for your time. Great. Um, I want to take a moment uh, before we lose track of this. Uh, I want to go ahead and do public comment, and then I want to come back to the committee um, and ask before we adjourn the committee of the whole, you are welcome to stay. And since it's committee of the whole and we're going to look at financials, please feel free to stay. Um, Sarah, there will be a point in time where we do take a vote, whether it's today or not. It'll be a vote to recommend or however. That vote will then go to the council. There is a requirement that because uh, that, this, that there will be a public forum on the CPA, and then there will be a vote of the council with regard to the CPA. Um, and I'm looking at those dates and working through those with uh, Paul and Sean and David and so forth. But we will make sure we keep you apprised. Before I take public comment, I do want to just say, Sarah, I, I just am astounded and so um, thankful that you are willing to take on this job and pull together so many disparate facts for Amherst. Um, it's very, very useful. And that has brought a lot to this conversation. So um, with that, I'm going, we have one person in the audience. They have, now we have two people in the audience and they would like to make public comment. So we're gonna ask Meg Gage to enter the room um, state your name, where you live, and go ahead, Meg. Thank you, Lynn. Can you hear me? We can. I need to turn the radio down. Um, uh, thank you uh, for having public comment. I want to put a, a plug in for the Mill River Project and express huge thanks to the CPA committee, and especially Sarah, who, echoing Lynn, uh, masters an extraordinary amount of information. and. Um, but everyone on the committee as well as a historic commission and the conservation commission and Jane Wald and Jen, especially for helping. Uh, there's the North Amherst was 
the height of industrialism in the early 19th century. Actually, in 1775, there were already six mills on the Mill River between Montague Road and the Cushman Common. Uh, and they had their cellar holes and remnants that are disappearing for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes young people try to dam up the river in order to make swimming areas where they don't exist. And uh, people are finding artifacts, uh, Civil War coins, and that are just disappearing. So it's really important to us to save this history. But it's also important as a community project, and we're using an approach called community archaeology, in which the community becomes the kind of docents, guardians. We know that communities are better protectors of historic uh, treasures than government, but working together uh, is the best plan. Um, I'm really tempted to tell you all about the history, but that's what you'll get to find out as we go forward. We've created, we're creating a community committee that's going to help uh, shepherd this process along. Uh, and we've recently decided that in, in addition to the industrial history, I mean, when I say industrial, it was, you know, mills making pencils and lumber and so on. It wasn't, <laughs> it was all with power by water. Uh, we're going to also look at pre-colonial history and, and, and include the, uh, what was, who were the people who were living here before colonial people were. Um, we have also uh, a resident who's volunteered to write proposals for us. We're this, we originally applied for $160,000 for the whole thing, which includes a website and all sorts of things. And last year that was rejected and this much more modest proposal. Uh, was accepted, although we did have to go to the, there was some difference of opinion about whether it qualified. So thanks again to Sarah for going to the town council and getting that approval. We are seeking 501c3 status this year. And we, uh, there's a, people are doing research on foundation support and there's a lot of, of available funding for history projects, but it, it requires this first research so that we have something to build on. Uh, and so this $12,900 is going to multiply many times uh, with outside funding that we're confident uh, we can find once we get tax exempt status. I'll just give you an example. While you're playing pickleball in the Mill River Recreation Park, which I hope happens, that's such a great idea, and you look to the north, uh, you'll see a berm, like a bank that goes all along the side of the Mill River Park. That's the remains of a canal that took water that diverted. If you go down into the woods, you can see that remember where the dam is brought water all the way up the side of what's now Mill River Park and then over to the grist mill. And then it would fall down to rejoin the river, turning the grist mill, making flour. Okay. So it's anyway, thank you. I hope you support it. Thank you, Meg. Um, Tony Cunningham, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello. Hi, Tony. Hi, uh, it's Tony Cunningham. I live on Owen Drive. I just wanted to flag for the Finance Committee uh, the initial square footage being proposed for the elementary school building project, which is available in the packet for this evening's school committee meeting. It's 114,000 square feet, which is 28,000 square feet beyond what the MSBA recommends for a school for 575 children. And what this means, if my math is correct, is we're proposing a, approximately a $100 million school project, potentially $90 million, which I think is at least 20 million beyond our budget. And so I would encourage councillors to get involved at this point to push to have that building proposal scaled back. Um, from my math, anything beyond 19,000 square feet is going to exceed our hoped for budget. And so that means pushing the schools to carve a lot of square feet off their proposal as it stands right now. And so I think it hasn't yet been discussed at a school building committee meeting, but I expect it will be at the next one but it is on the agenda for the school committee tonight. And the plan, as far as I'm aware, is to submit this to the MSBA in the next few weeks. So I think it's, it's, it's urgent that the councillors get involved at this point and push to get this building scaled back, or we're gonna have another overly sized building proposal that's gonna have a trouble passing at an override. And it's gonna take money from the fire station, the DPW, Crocker Farm, and any of the other needs the town has, if it ends up being 
$100 million instead of 70 or 75. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Tony. Uh, I'm going to return to um, the Finance Committee, and um, I'm going to suggest that we not vote today uh, in that we want to make sure we get some other things covered. Is there anybody who would like to suggest that we do go ahead and vote? Please raise your hand. And this would be a vote of just the Finance Committee. Okay, I think we will plan to try to vote at our next finance committee meeting, which I just wanna get right out there and say is uh, two weeks from today, I believe. Um, no, it's next week, I thought. Yeah, next week, the 15th, I believe 15th. is our. It is the 15th, thank you. And do I also have one on the 22nd? I don't think there's one on the 22nd. I think the next one after the 15th is um, March, whatever that uh, first or second okay. Tuesday Thank in you. March is. All right. So the next finance committee meeting is um, next Tuesday at nine o'clock, the 15th at nine o'clock. Um, Sarah, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry. There's a panelist that just put their hand up. No, that was me. I just asking if, if I should. I Please. I just want to, you're <laughs> welcome to stay, but thank you so much for everything that you've done and uh, for bringing forward such a, an amazing set of proposals and the work up to get them to us. So I, we just cannot say enough to you and the committee for all of that. So well, thank, thank you, you for joining us today. I have the feeling we're going to need to have you come back on more than one occasion. Thanks. Before I go, I just want to say, uh, give my thanks to Sonia and Sean. They, they, they do the financial, the, you know, modeling to show what we can accomplish. So um, they Great. get a lot of the thanks too, but I will leave you now. So thanks. And I, we would all second that thanks to them um, as well. Okay. Um, we're going to go on, uh, Sean, I think we'd like to look at the first and second quarter. Sonia, are you doing that or is Sean? So Sonia's gonna walk us through it. If it's okay with you, we're gonna focus pretty much just on the second quarter because the first quarter is pretty early and the second quarter will capture everything that is important. Um, Do you so, wanna put that up? Yeah, Sonia, okay, if I share it and you just tell me when to scroll. Sure. Okay. And I'll just start off um, by explaining the timing of these quarterly reports for the courtesy to the new council members and finance committee members. The quarterly, the first quarterly report is in flux for a long period of time, which is why it takes so long to get it out. And the reason for that is the revenue side of the budget is still in flux until we set the tax rate. So once the tax rate is set, then I usually start pulling together the first quarter report and right after that, the second quarter report. And the reason for that is I don't want to put numbers out there that are going to change, continue to change and confuse everybody. So that's the reason the first quarter report is so late. When it comes to the second and third quarter, it usually takes 30 days after the quarter ends for us to pull it together because funds are still getting recorded in the previous month. Um, and the fourth quarter, of course, takes the longest because I'm closing out a whole year and there's a lot of other things there. So I'll start off by reiterating that um, budgets for local receipts were significant, significantly reduced in fiscal year 21. And we increased them a bit in 22, but they're still not at pre-pandemic levels. And this can skew some of the um, percentages on what's been collected. And I'll start off with Cherry Hill. We did, um, we did budget some revenues for that this year, but again, still not up to the levels of pre-pandemic, which it shows 90.5% collected. And some of that is to the budget being um, reduced and there was a lot more use of Cherry Hill than we expected. I guess everybody needed to get out into the fresh air during, during the COVID. And Sonia, also, can I add to that real quick? Huh? Can I add to that real quick? Um, sure. Or maybe you were about to say this, but the other thing that we're still sort of adjusting for is the closure of Hickory and how yeah. that might impact usage of Cherry Hill in the future. Thanks, Sean. That was my next sentence. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of these, the ones that 
stick right out, recreation department, that's only collected at 21.7%. And we're currently working with the rec department now to reconcile the revolving accounts. There's usually an admin fee that gets transferred over, but um, we haven't had the chance to finish that yet. So that'll be more accurate in the next quarterly report. The next thing is licenses and permits. And um, this is, we've collected, Sorry, I didn't write down the collection right here. We've, co oh. We've had higher than expected permit count for electrical and buildings so far this year, which, which is why we've collected um, so much of this. The land is at 87.2% collected. The landfill, and there's a landfill solar project that accounts for 135,000 of it. And we also have a few uh, more projects with large fees coming up mid-year, but this could fall in either fiscal year 22 or 23. We're just, we're not sure yet. So we're looking good with licenses and permits. Point, point of order, could somebody scroll this text larger so we can actually read it? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Sean. Keep up. I'm at Hotel Motel now. Is that big enough, Pam? Thank you. Um, hotel, motel, and meals tax are coming in a bit better than expected. And I'll also note that the budgets are reduced in this for this one. So that kind of skews the percentage a little bit, but they are coming in better than we expected at this time of year. Uh, special assessments, these depend on timely information from the Pioneer Valley Transportation Association. And once we have their final numbers, we can then bill UMass and five colleges and get the revenue in. And we just received those numbers. So the billing will go out in the third quarter. So Sonia, I'll just add two quick, or one quick thing, which is so of these revenues, um, probably the two most important for economic indicators are the licenses and permits and the hotel motel meals and cannabis taxes. Those sort of indicate the economic activity that are going on in town. Um, so the fact that those are trending positively is a, is a, is a good sign. Okay, and on the expenditure side, and I don't think I said it in the beginning, but this is the general fund that I'm going through right now. So when you're looking at, in the packet, in the report, you have, um, you have reports on revenues and where we are with expenditures at this point in time. And then there's another report that shows comparative over three years. So there's a lot of detail on these back pages. So I've just kind of summarized it in the, in the verbiage, but um, I encourage everybody to go in and, and look at those. For expenditures, we're at 57% expended at this point, but if you take out what's encumbered for contracts, we are at 55.5%. So we're pretty much on target for all of that. Um, some of the budgets were reduced, so that's why it's a little higher than the 50%. I'll point out that um, the town manager's budget shows 38% expended. However, we are going to be moving some of the budget line there into the DEI department. So that's going to change. So in the third quarter, you'll see a shift there. The expenditures just be starting this month actually. Uh, employee benefits, we're moving retirement assessment and OPEP contributions to other local assessments. And the reason we're doing this is with having them in the um, general government and employee benefits, it skews the general, what our um, general government budget balance is. So we're moving it to other assessments so that we have a clearer picture. And that's gonna happen in the second, in the, um, I think it did happen in this quarter. Miscellaneous and insurance. Um, this is shows at 173.5% expended. The reason for this is we always pay for our property and casualty insurance premiums up front. And through the course of the year, we allocate those costs out to the schools, the library, and the enterprise funds in the region. So that will normalize. Uh, the community responder program or CREST program that 
has no activity in the general fund at this point. I'm not sure if we spent ARPA funds on that yet, but there's been no activity in, in the general in the general fund. Snow and ice, I have no prediction on that at this point. Uh, it it's, looks like it's largely overspent, but that's a contract for um, salt, sand, and treatment for the roads. Uh, a lot of years, we end up closing out some of that, so it reduces the budget, but at this point, I can't predict, and I don't dare. And then the enterprise funds, um, sewer is at 46.6% and water is at 44.5% collected. The collection is lagging just a little bit in rates. But if you look at the um, comparison report, three-year comparison report, you'll see that we did better this year than we have in the last three years for water and sewer rates. So. Um, our, our sewer rates calculated as a percentage of water consumption and water consumption has gone down. So that's affected the water and sewer rates over the last few years, but we've made quite a few adjustments to get that in line. And right now we're doing pretty well with that. Um, expenditures were, are at, they should be same, same thing applies there. If there's any contracts or encumbrances, it kind of skews the, the expenditures. <clears throat> Solid waste fund is at 79.3% collected and revenues usually come in at the beginning and at the end of the year for this fund. So there's no, I'm not concerned about anything at this point. The operating budget in this fund is typically very tight. However, we can only budget, budget there what we, what we expect in revenues. So at this point, this fund has not been able to support admin fees being paid to the general fund or indirect costs. Transportation fund is at 50.1% collection. This is good. However, the budget is reduced in the previous years. Um, in fiscal year 21, we ended up with a $288,000 deficit. However, we used opera funds to, to replace that deficit. And, the only, and I just want to point out that the only sources of revenue for this fund are parking fees and parking fines. And as I said, there's a lot more detail in this report in the, in the um, continued pages. Any questions? Okay. Questions? Bob Hegner. Yeah. Uh Sonia and and, and um, Sean, are these just the the um, the actual Amherst budgets, and they don't include the ARPA funds, or are any ARPA funds included in here? No, this is general fund and enterprise funds. Okay, um, and then among the for the sewer and water funds, what has the experience been for UMass so far this year? Um, that obviously was a big issue during COVID. Yeah, uh, that's something we have looked at recently. Their consumption is more in line with pre-pandemic. It's not all the way back to where it was pre-pandemic. Um, they were trending down anyway because they've been putting into place a lot of water efficiency um, improvements. But the, the consumption is closer to where it was before the pandemic last year, it really bottomed out when they were gone for half the year. Um, right. But we've been watching that closely because that's such a key driver of um, the revenue for our enterprise funds. Right. Thanks. Michelle? Michelle? I have a question about our two new departments. I don't know if this is the, the right time to ask that question. Mm -hmm. Please okay. go ahead. So um, seeing that I think a majority of the funding for those two new departments is coming from ARPA, and I just, I guess I have some concern about how we plan to sustain and build uh, those departments given ARPA is temporary. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Let me just lay out what the plan is for both of those departments. Um, so ARPA in terms of the uh, CREST program is only being used for startup costs. It's not funding any operational or other than maybe vehicles, like the initial vehicle purchase, it's not funding any operational costs. Um, so the budget for Crest for this year is about 200,000 and we have an earmark for additional funds. And then next year for FY23, the budget we're about to work on, 
the plan is to implement the rest of the operating budget for the 10 responders or the 10 the 10 positions in that department um, which is when we look at the projections later if not today or um, at the next meeting you'll see that's one of the reasons why we're asking for additional funds for the town um, budget is to fully implement CRESS. Um, DEI in a, in a similar way we're we're using ARPA just for this year FY22 to fund half of the um, coordinator position the director position is being funded from the uh, economic development director that is a it's in the operating budget. Um, the town manager repurposed those funds to fund the DEI director. So the DEI director funding is already in the operating budget. Um, half of the DEI coordinator, because there's, there's two positions, so half of the DEI coordinator is already within the operating budget because that also was a position that was in the town manager's office. So really all we have to do for that department is phase in the other half, which we're planning to do for FY23 as well. Um, and then any supplies, um, any supplies related to that program um, or that department. Uh, and then the other thing I'll say is we also, a year ago, we added $80,000 for DEI um, efforts and anti-racism efforts. So there is $80,000 in the town manager's budget right now, specifically for that type of work. Thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you, Sean. I'm just wondering in regards to, you said that there are funds earmarked for, I'm specifically asking about CRESS um, mm -hmm. for the following year. So does that mean that that amount has already been determined or what does it mean that the funds are earmarked? So there's an earmark in ARPA of 250,000 for startup costs. So that will stay until those startup costs are identified exactly what they are. Um, for CRESS, we've projected an estimate of the cost based on what the um, the budget that was presented to the council that they approved. We know there might be some adjustments in that once things are worked out. We know like the um, the position classifications and things like that are still to be finalized. Um, but we have projected an estimate of what we think it'll cost so that we can see where we need to end up. Um, do we have that number? Uh, so it would it was based on and I can set it out after. It was based on what was presented to the town council for projected budget. For Cress. Okay, if you could send that to me, that would be awesome. Thank yep. you. Thank. We'll make sure the full committee gets it. Thanks for asking those questions, uh, Kathy. I was just going to weigh in that that there's a finance committee report on this, um, looking at out years, or projecting. But at that point, Sean, um, we didn't put, uh, we didn't go out very far. You had showed us internally what. Mm -hmm the whole budget could look like. Um, and my memory is the first two years look like we figured out how we're spending it by the, the third, fourth, and fifth year, not so. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking that we might want to come back to this at the Finance Committee to have another look at it when you get on firmer ground. Mm -hmm. so, so we did Alicia, in that report that we we'll can send you, it shows the first couple of years and how the money works out, but it we're under a lot of pressure by year three, four, and five for everything else. You know, so the school budgets, the uh, the rest of the town. Um, so I I just want to say that it's it it's sort of balanced for a couple of years, but then not. Yeah. So and just to speak to that, so we're we're projected out how we can add um, the two new departments and potentially four additional firefighters as well. Um, so when we looked at that projection with the additional $300,000 for FY23, we think that will get us through um, FY23 and FY24. Um, FY25 is when the firefighter costs would hit and that's where we start seeing some struggles. And so we're gonna have to work out you, you know, if our revenues increase faster, we're going to, have to identify additional revenues um, or make other operating budget adjustments in order to fund the, the priorities. Okay. Um, Bernie. A question and a comment. Um, the question is, is the, the, the economic development director, which position, which sort of got, is, the, is that still shifted over to ARPA funds? Um, yeah, we have a we have an earmark in ARPA for the next two and a half years to fund that type of um, the economic work. development director. Okay, yeah. and and the comment is for the the new counselors. Uh, 
you may be interested to note that snow and ice removal is the only thing in Mass General Law that uh, the town can expend in excess of appropriation. Um, <laughs> it is New England after all. So it's it's a tradition to to uh, to, to guesstimate your snow and ice removal funds. <laughs> Bernie, thank you. Alicia. Um, and then I just had a follow up question. The economic development position will, though, be a permanent ongoing position after the two years of the ARPA funding is out. Is that something we're going to continue to try to fund? Um, so right now it's funded with temporary grant funds. So as it stands now, it would go away after two and a half years because the, the funding within the operating budget was converted to the DEI director uh, position. So right now that position, if it was to be continued, there would have to be other grant funds or it would have to be added um, back to the budget. So that would be a decision we'd have to make in a few years. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to note it is 11 o'clock or two minutes of. Normally this meeting would end at 11. We have certainly not finished our agenda. And, but I would like to see people raise their hands if they need to leave at this point. Okay, then um, Andy would kill me for this, but we're gonna continue on. Pat Are did have any? a hand up. I'm sorry? Would you, Pat I'm did sorry. have a hand up. Yeah, I had my oh. hand up. I have uh, another meeting. Okay. Starting at 11, the Disability Access Awareness Committee, so. We still have a quorum of the full council if you need to leave, Pat, thank you. Thank Lynn, you. Do you, thank you. Oh, do you still have a quorum if I also duck out or no? Uh, I'm sorry, who was that that said that? It's Anna, sorry, Anna. my Zoom is me. Anna, yes, you do. Okay, I do need it's to. Only, it's only, the main thing is that I need a quorum of the finance committee. To That's what I figured. Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, uh, bye all, thank bye. you. Yep. Two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven. We still have a quorum of the council. Okay, are there any other questions on the first or second quarter report? Um, okay, then uh, let's skip. I, I just want to mention one thing about the meeting schedule. We have meetings set, I believe, through the end of April. When uh, we meet next week, I want us to be prepared to look at how we can figure out to meet um, up to twice a week in the month of May. Because when we do the budget, it is almost critical that we do that. And one of the suggestions I'm going to, I made already to Andy, and that is that we do one daytime meeting each week and one evening meeting each week and carefully select which items, for instance, might be more interest to the general public and do those in the evening and so forth. But that's a, a discussion for next week. Kathy, on that um, uh, yeah, um, I, I think that's great, Lynn. Um, I just want uh, want to register, particularly with Finance Committee, that the two dates that were selected in March, I can't make either of them. Um, and I had originally done in every other week. So maybe when we meet next time, we can just look at, at those dates and whether um, I can make the other March states, you know, if we just shift it. So I just would like to review that calendar. I'm fine for February. Okay, so we're going to look at calendar. That's a preview of next, uh, the me next meeting. Uh, Sean, do you want to quickly do uh, anything on the update for revenue and expenditure projections? Sure, do you want me just to combine that real quick with BCG? Yeah. Um, so we had a budget coordinating group meeting last week or the week before, which is um, three council members, two school committee members, and two library trustees. And we right. met to review updated budget projections. Um, we reviewed the governor's budget um, and what was in there. Um, we didn't have health insurance yet, so we weren't able to talk about that. And we basically just sort of shared um, shared what we're working on with our budget. Um, we talked about the additional $300,000 um, for the town municipal budget and, and what uh, the, the need for that. Um, the schools talked about um, some of their challenges and um, how they're balancing use of grant funds. Uh, they have grant funds just like we do um, related to ARPA. Um, 
so it was a productive meeting. I think we all walked away sort of having the same knowledge and in a, a good spot. Um, Lynn, do you want me to quickly share the projections? Just go through it ultra why don't fast. You, yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. By the way, myself, Andy, and uh, Mandy Joe represent the council on the BCG meeting. So is this large enough for people to see? Yes. Okay. Um, so the, the I'll point out what's changed since when we presented this at the financial indicators meeting. Um, so one major change is, as Sonia mentioned earlier, now we have the FY22 recap. So our revenues are set as, it's, uh, as it relates to the budget. So you may see some of these revenue numbers changed a little bit for FY22, and it's based on whether there were any recap adjustments um, that were made, uh, like new growth was finalized and things of that nature. Uh, for FY23 revenues, um, we updated we updated the special assessments because we received the um, updated for PBT. I think that's the update. I, I believe that's the updated PBTA assessment. I'll have to double check that. Um, we get a letter every year that has the total PBTA assessment. Um, or sorry, this is the revenue. So this is the money coming into us. So this is updated for, right. there's two sides to that. There's the assessment, which is down below in the next slide. Then there's the money that comes into us. We get reimbursed um, from UMass and five colleges for their share of the PBTA routes. So this is updated to reflect the, the, re, the new reimbursement that we expect from five colleges and from UMass. So that is the updated number. Uh, the state aid section has been completely updated to reflect the FY23 um, governor's proposal. Usually that's the, uh, the, the lowest point. So we hope some of these numbers will go up. Um, but we, from a conservative perspective, we, we usually stick with the governor's numbers. So chapter okay. 70 went up very little. Um, did you want to say something, Lynn? Or yeah, only to say that people are very disappointed that the governor's only gone to two point seven for state aid. Yeah. So the way that works is the governor made a promise that whatever the consensus revenue numbers go up, that they work out with the legislature. Whatever that goes up, they'll they'll give the same increase to cities and towns. Um, so in some ways, that's been nice. It, it allows you to bank a number. It you know, keeps it consistent with what they're projecting. Um, where people are really frustrated is, you know, the, the number's been really low the last couple of years, um, I think zero one year, and and revenue came in much higher. The actual revenue came in much higher, I think, you know, millions yeah. in terms of surplus. <laughs> or, um, so, so that's why people are hoping this number will get bumped up even beyond that commitment, uh, which would be really uh, beneficial for Amherst in particular. And just to mention, the, the governor's budget um, is the first, the House and the Senate each have theirs budget, then they go to conference committee, they come up with a budget, it goes back to the governor, he can veto, hopefully all of that gets done by the end of June, And um, but it's during the House and the Senate process that we would hope to see this go up. Uh -huh. Yeah, and if there's any um, advocacy that goes on around the budget, these are the areas that would be um, really important. Um, charter reimbursement is another one that that money um, relates to how many students go to schools, uh, charter schools, and the increase each year and how many go there. Um, and then we get reimbursed a portion. So this has been updated. So all these numbers have been updated. Um, we also increased the ambulance fund. So the way that works is when our EMS staff um, go out and on calls, they can bill for insurance. Um, and then we also have some agreements with other entities for providing EMS services. All that money goes into an, um, an ambulance fund and then we appropriate a portion of it each year. And the, we can only appropriate money that we have. We can't do it based on anticipated revenues. We have to have it in the account before it can be appropriated. So Sonia does a really nice job of tracking the revenues and letting us know what she thinks um, we'll have by the time this is voted. So we've increased, we, um, you can see where it used to be back in the prior year. This dipped down a lot during the pandemic, um, especially when UMass left because calls dropped and there, were, there was fewer, um, just fewer calls in general. Uh, we're seeing it start to tick back up. Um, and the other thing we did, uh, a couple other events that affected this, we obviously lost the Hadley routes a couple of years ago, which resulted in a drop in revenue. But shortly thereafter, we increased fees, ambulance billing fees that the insurers uh, pay. Um, or anybody pays who's paying those fees directly. And so that will result in a revenue uptick. And we still haven't seen like what a normal year looks like without Hadley and with these higher fees because it's it's been the pandemic since that point. 
Um, CPA, this number should look familiar. This is the debt number. So it comes in as a revenue and then it'll go out on the expense side. Um, and I'll just keep going for sake of time. So these numbers haven't really changed the operating budget. This is what we're proposing as the, um, is what each department would get for their operating budgets next year. It's norm two and a half percent is sort of our normal level because that's generally what taxes are allowed to go up. Um, and so we try to keep it at two and a half percent as a sustainable increase. Uh, this year in particular, we're proposing an extra 300,000 for the town to help implement um, the new department's DEI and CRESS. Uh, capital, this will shuffle around a lot when we work through the capital plan with JCPC, so I wouldn't get too stuck on these individual numbers, but the, um, the, most imp the number that won't change likely is the amount we're dedicating to capital, which is 10% of the tax levy. So this 10% number um, is where part of our plan for funding capital, especially our plan for funding the four building projects. And so getting to 10% is a key step in that plan. Um, you can see where we've been in past years. Uh, we dropped down really low during the pandemic. Um, FY22 went up really high because we took um, the money that we had set aside in FY21 that we didn't touch, we just set aside as a reserve. And since it wasn't used in FY21, we were able to put it towards capital in FY22, which is why that number jumped up higher than normal. Um, but for FY23, we're back on track with our plan of 10%. Um, we have our pension assessment in there, which this is the pension for all, um, all departments, but not the enterprise funds. Enterprise funds get divvied out to, um, to those systems to pay, but it includes the assessment um, for the elementary schools, the library, and for the um, town. OPEB, we're back to uh, 500,000. The year before was originally 250, um, or maybe, I think maybe originally it was 300, but we brought back uh, during the free cash transfer this past year to make up for what we had cut during the pandemic. You might remember there was a, um, an, a request for OPEB contributions, and that was to make up for the, uh, what we had cut in prior years related to the pandemic. And we, the last thing I'll point out is our state assessments. We have updated this as well to reflect the governor's budget. Um, so that's gone up 10%. The two uh, biggest factors there, our PVTA assessment went up quite a bit. That's, and that's mainly because we're part of a system and a lot of places their bus routes um, dropped off a little bit during the pandemic, but because we had the college um, who maintained a lot of their routes throughout the pandemic, our share went up a little bit. This is something we think will correct itself and talking to their finance director there, she thinks this is sort of a temporary blip because of the pandemic. And once bus routes get back to normal, um, It'll, it'll hopefully drop back down or the increases will be moderated in the future. Um, and then the other reason for this increase is charter. So as, uh, as we get more charter revenue, it's usually related to an increase in charter tuition. So we, our, we saw a bump in our charter revenue, but that was driven by, this, by a projected uh, charter tuition increase. And I will stop with that. Any questions? Let me also just point out that if you want, especially for new counselors, um, although several of you were at the financial indicators meeting, that was in November, um, that's where we started looking at this sheet, which is the beginning of preparing for the FY23 budget. Uh, we also held a budget forum uh, on November 15th. And then in December, the with the finance committee's work and Andy's um, pen, as well as several other uh, good suggestions from this committee, we did uh, recommend and the town council passed the financial guidelines uh, as we go into FY23. And so Paul and uh, Sean and the full staff are now in, you know, full mode, if you will, of preparing the FY23 budget. That will come to the council on May 1st and we must pass a budget by June 30th. And the finance committee must report back to the town council within I think it's 30 days of receiving the budget. So um, that's what makes the month of May so intense. It's when we hear from the various um, departments, uh, we get an opportunity to um, ask questions and 
in the past, we have also, I think, made several of those meetings committees of the whole so that, you know, it was nice to have several of you join us today, uh, particularly new counselors who've not been through this process before, because it really just begins to give you a little more in-depth and insight into budgets and the process. And I, I just have to say the complicated nature, and we are so blessed to have such terrific staff and Sean and Sonia. So, Kathy? Uh, just to build on what Lynn said about May, um, not only have we been posting it that everyone can come, but to the extent we, we talk about which departments we're gonna be talking on at right. each of the meetings, and to the extent people have questions, we've been, we implemented a process where we gather them in advance so and we collect them and Sean gets them to the department. So we have a focused discussion. Um, so, so I urge you when we first get that budget to pay attention and then it's which departments you might be interested in the more extensive discussion. The other uh, uh, learning curve that all of us were on, and if you read the charter, you saw this, the only thing we can do is cut. We can't move money. So when this budget comes to us, we can question a level and potentially go lower, but we can't say we'd like to go lower here and higher there. So that is our operating charter law. It's not uh, something where we've done some artful things around that to, to express different ways of spending, but we we're operating under those constraints. So I, I just wanted to say those two things that we do know the schedule of which departments and urge people to get comments in questions in early um, so that we can have the department discussions focus on those. And we ask for members of the finance committee to kind of each take a section of the budget and make sure you're a little more, uh, we are a little more um, familiar with it and kind of lead in the questions that get asked. Um, are there any other questions on this issue? Uh, I know as counselors, you all know that we have a four towns meeting on Thursday night. Uh, this will probably be maybe the last meeting before we finalize, uh, before the regional school budget is, um, now I don't want to say finalized, but um, we, we have to approve the regional school budget before we even finish up our own budget, because we have to do that in coordination with the other municipalities, all of which have town meetings and they meet earlier than we do. Um, so, uh, and it, it's been a contentious issue with the regional schools and we'll see what Thursday night is like. Um, the other thing I do wanna ask is, um, do we wanna go ahead and pass the minutes or shall I just continue that on to why don't I continue that on to November, I mean, to uh, February 15th. But Sean, I wanna just check with you. I have that we're gonna come back on the calendar. I believe we're doing the audit on the 15th. Yes, the, okay. yep, the audit is on the 15th. Um, okay. Tanya Campbell from Lance and Heath will be here to present the, the FY21 audit and um, the financial statements. Okay, and, and just to say that we do not have a separate audit committee. The finance committee is the audit committee for the town. Uh, and we're also dealing, I believe, with parking fees next week because we need to provide any observations, recommendations, or changes that we would like to see to TSO, Dorothy, um, so that when TSO gets ready and then they are going to be um, making some changes potentially and also then holding a hearing that hearing will be a committee of the whole. And Dorothy, that hearing will be on what date? You have to unmute. March 10th. Thank you. Okay. And so Sean, anything else on the agenda for next, next Tuesday? Those were the two, uh, the, the transportation fund, um, and the permits as it relates to the transportation fund. And then the audit were the two major items for next week. Okay, and then minutes. Okay, is there anything else, Kathy? 
Just, just really quickly for the people who are not members of the council, we can send you that parking proposal that was already presented to the council. So yes. that is available to take a look at. Um, and there were, to the extent you want to see the comments that were raised, we have minutes from that section. So that we discussed that a few weeks ago, but that is ready to be looked at since we only have a week till we meet next time. Yep. And I'll make sure that we get an, Sean and I will make sure we get an agenda posted with Athena and materials in the packet and sent out to you. Are there any other questions or comments from any counselors or any of the non-voting resident members? Then I am going to adjourn both the town council meeting and the finance committee meeting. And thank you. This was a very productive morning and lots of good questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. Thank you.